I'm happy to introduce Sean Keenan with FWC. He's connecting to us from the FWRI lab in St. Petersburg, and he's been with the agency for 14 years. Welcome, Sean, and take it away. Thank you, Keith. Uh, this is a great opportunity to introduce some information that, uh, on artificial reef habitats and how they're being incorporated into fishery surveys um, supported by the state as well as federal partners. So we all understand the value of long-term uh, monitoring data. It allows us to uh, assess population statuses, relative abundance of populations to know if uh, they're increasing or decreasing over time. Um, also allows us to assess size composition data to see if that's um, having an influence on population effects. It also allows to assess the impact of certain environmental stressors, whether they be short-term duration, like such as red tide events or oil spills, or long-term duration events, such as uh, climate change or introduction of uh, invasive species. So reef fish surveys in the Gulf of Mexico have generally relied on uh, this gear type as seen here. It's an underwater remote um, video camera. Um, it's a baited system uh, that's deployed in one location. It sits on the bottom and records all the species and habitats that um, are around, around that um, particular deployment location. It gives us an estimate of relative abundance in the form of max N. Kevin Thompson will speak on that in a little bit more detail um, in, the, in the following talk. Since it's a stereo system and allows for measurements of any individual that is captured um, from both lenses. So it eliminates the need for um, laser systems. Reef fish surveys in the Gulf of Mexico have been going on for quite a while. Uh, the National Marine Fisheries Service in Pascagoula has conducted surveys uh, since the early 90s, um, focusing on natural reef habitats, predominantly on the outer shelf systems. Panama City NIMS Lab started their survey in 2005, focusing in areas in the Florida Panhandle as well as the Big Bend, again, focusing on natural systems. In 2008, FWRI, we got into the game by assessing a, an, a spatial gap in data on the West Florida shelf that's covered, shown here. So these surveys each use very uh, similar gear types to uh, evaluate fish communities. However, there were subtle differences in some of the survey designs and um, overall this can lead to notable limitations when it comes to assessing stocks using all of these surveys. So while it's important to get information on iconic species of interest, our goal is that to generate a multi-species approach to evaluate the commu reef fish community in general. There are many commercial, econom economically important reef fish species in the Gulf, and we want to generate a survey that optimizes for um, as many of those species as possible, as well as as many of those habitats. So our approach is to look at it on the assemblage level with an emphasis on managed reef species. So between 2014 and 2019, we had an opportunity to expand our sampling effort through a grant from National Fish and Wildlife um, Foundation. FWRI was provided funds to expand our sampling effort to deeper waters, to broader areas that overlapped with the National Marine Fisheries Surveys, as well as incorporating other habitats, especially artificial reefs in this case. So it allowed us to have a, a good uh, amount of effort to ca calibrate with our partners in this survey effort. So the goal is to make these three surveys combined into one, is to optimize the effort here. This is a conceptual diagram that's outlining the G Fisher survey. It's restore funded effort that will go for the next five years. But today I'm going to focus on this one small but significant component to it, and that is developing the spatial stratification and the habitat stratification to optimize this survey for bringing in all data from all three. So the main approach is to integrate information that we've already collected on reef fish abundance from multiple species, as well as habitat data. The habitat data that we've collected is predominantly from side scan sonar surveys conducted by FWRI in the Eastern Gulf of Mexico um, over multiple small scale habitat um, areas. So with, since it's a stratified random approach, it allows us to have a representative sample of the, uh, uh, the habitat distribution as a whole on the shelf. And there is a poster um, describing some of these results. So 
please stop by and uh, take a look at that. So we take the information from the abundance data as well as the habitat data and we put it together in some statistical gymnastics utilizing information from thousands of camera data sets. So we have the information from multiple species of interest from over 6,000 camera sets. So the, the, the graphic shown here, imagine the, all the camera sets along the x-axis along the bottom, and then you can see how the, the statistical approaches will allow us to group these uh, camera sets um, into more similar uh, species that are observed. So that also the data inputs that come into this are things that we know before the cameras are set, such as the latitude, longitude, the depth of the camera set, as well as the habitat data that comes from the side scan surveys. So this grouping approach allows us to generate a plot such as this. It's a map of all of the, the sampling points that have been conducted over the um, former years. And then all the similar colors are um, specific camera sets that are similar to each other in the species communities. So this approach allows us to set up a spatial structure for how to guide our sampling efforts for the future. So we take those data and we put it into something more logistically friendly and we can have a three by three design where we have three regions along the, the Eastern Gulf of Mexico and three depth strata as shown here. So setting up the spatial strata is the first point. The second step is to set up that habitat stratification. And we did this from utilizing information that we had from the side scan surveys for both natural and artificial reefs. So first I'll show some of the results from the artificial reef strata. The main um, uh, factors that structured the communities were the relief of the strata as well as the area coverage. So we had three relief strata, low relief, medium, and high relief. And these are examples of the uh, artificial habitats that uh, comprise those uh, relief categories. And you can see from the image in the middle, we also delineate around every identified habitat type, be it natural or artificial. And that gives us a, an exact estimate of the size of the structure. So we wanted to look at the distribution of areas of coverage from each of the, the relief categories. So we had over 5,000 polygons of artificial habitat that's been mapped in the Eastern Gulf. And we're able to generate these frequency dis, um, dis, distributions. And from this, we're able to identify three general spatial um, um, area coverage strata. So we had a small scale habitat features, which were the most abundant, as would be expected, medium scale um, coverage features, and then large scale, so over 100 square meters habitat. So the, the goal is to, to assign some sampling effort to each of these uh, habitat strata within those spatial strata where it's available. Just to give some relief, um, results from the natural habitat strata, we went through the same type um, pr pr process. Again, identified that low relief, medium relief, and high relief features structured reef fish communities differently. And then the area coverage was also a um, uh, factor that influences reef fish communities. So for natural relief, relief features, these are, these are how the habitat strata broke out. We have a low relief small scale, low relief medium, low relief large, and then for all the other relief categories. Low relief natural reefs were by far the most abundant that was mapped within the eastern Gulf of Mexico. So we take the information from the spatial strata and from the habitat strata, and we go through a lot more steps in order to come with a map such as this. This is the distribution of our sampling sites that were selected for 2020, the first year of this, this optimized survey design. The sites in green are our natural reefs, the sites in red are the targeted artificial reefs, and then we allocate effort based upon habitat availability as well as species variability. So I'm ha happy to say that even with delays related to the virus, we have had multiple cruises that have uh, um, sampled over a thousand sites in the Eastern Gulf in 2020. It's a great data set to get started. So in conclusion, in the Eastern Gulf of Mexico natural and artificial reef, we have a three by three spatial stratification three by three habitat stratification for both natural and artificial reefs. This five year grant will allow us to really evaluate this data set to integrate it with our historic data that we've collected 
And it's not just happening in the east. This is also happening in the Western Gulf as well. Acknowledgements, many funding sources contributed to this as well as large, uh, many people have sat and looked at videos for hours to collect these data. And I'll be happy to take any questions in the Q&A. Thank you. I'd like to introduce Kevin Thompson. He's calling from his office in St. Petersburg, and he's been with the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission for seven years. Welcome, Kevin, and take it away. Great, thanks, Heath, and everybody. Um, I'll be speaking on uh, how we've been putting some efforts towards incorporating data from artificial reef monitoring into our indices of abundance in the Gulf of Mexico to support, support regional assessments. So with that, the data set we're talking about is the stereo baited remote underwater video survey, the SBROV survey that Sean has mentioned in his talk. Uh, here is an example of one of the camera pods again. And these are the kind of data we're generating, which is fish counts and habitat metrics for the sites we are assessing. It's a non-capture method of sampling. Uh, it allows for stereo video imaging, which means we get um, important measurements of select taxa. The metric I'll be talking about is max n, which is the maximum number of fish of a species seen at one time throughout a 20 minute video read. And again, like I mentioned, we get some very important habitat metrics from this data that includes say the presence or absence or amount of sponge, rock, corals and relief and things like that. Uh, FWRI survey efforts have been designed to augment the ongoing NIMS survey efforts in the region, as Sean mentioned as well. Uh, as you can see for the FWRI video, the main thing is that our efforts really started in zones four and five off of Charlotte Harbor and Tampa Bay to really augment the sampling that was going on in the inshore uh, shelf region of South Florida, because Panama City, shown in green, was really sampling the inshore panhandle area whereas Pascagoula is the longest time series and that is always focused here on the, uh, towards the shelf in the deeper sites. Uh, what we have in FWRI is data from 2010 in that zones four and five area. However, we expanded to zones nine and 10, which is in the panhandle uh, in 2014. And that's when we started to uh, drop cameras and assess fish on artificial reefs as well. And then from 2016 on, we've had efforts throughout the entire West Florida shelf on natural and artificial reefs. So overall, my objectives uh, that I'm showing you in this presentation is to uh, illustrate how we can incorporate uh, data from artificial and natural reefs from the survey into a single index of abundance of managed reef fish for the Southeast Data Assessment and Review, or CDAR process. Um, this is really driven by the increasing interest in artificial reef dynamics at these meetings. And we want to develop a kind of straightforward yet statistically defensible and valid way of combining these data sets. So what I'm building on are some previous work we've done that goes towards incorporating those three independent video surveys, the Pascagoula, the Panama City, and the FWRI. Uh, we've put a lot of effort into combining these into one single index that allows for a stronger, um, more overall Gulf of Mexico signal to go into these assessments. And what you can see here in this figure is uh, for vermilion snapper on natural reef sites from a previous assessment, we have time series for Pascagoula, Panama City in orange, and FWRI in gray. And using these methods, we can combine those data into one single index shown here in black that is the overall trend for the eastern Gulf of Mexico in this case uh, for vermilion snapper. So using those methods, uh, we took a sample of our data from FWRI only in those zones nine and 10 shown here in red um, in the panhandle from 2014 through 2018. And you can see here the breakdown of sample sizes for artificial and natural reefs sampled for each year. So it's ranging in a little over hundred to up to 200 per year. Um, definitely more natural sites on average. Uh, however, artificials are pretty well represented given the frequency of occurrence of them in the area. You can see the breakdown of how those sites um, are distributed. They're pretty well interdispersed uh, with each other. However, the natural sites you can see go off a little bit more offshore, a little bit deeper than the artificial sites that we have in this uh, survey. So with this, I'll be talking about a couple study species 
uh, great triggerfish, red snapper, greater amberjack, and vermilion snapper. These were chosen because we catch them in relatively high numbers on both types of habitats, natural and artificial. They are both managed and have been um, the focus of a couple of recent assessments. Now, if we just look at the overall abundance summaries for these fish, um, you'd see a pattern that many people in this audience would probably be familiar with working on artificial reefs that we do on average find more fish on the artificial reefs compared to the natural reefs. So what I'm showing you is just the mean max n in this standard errors uh, for each of those species. And the percentages above show the percent increase from the natural habitat to the artificial habitat. So it can range from only a 25% increase on gray trigger fish, meaning they're pretty evenly distributed amongst the habitats, where greater amberjack is one of our least common fish, but is double in abundance uh, on artificial reefs compared to natural reefs. And then red snapper and vermilion, you know, are, are also increased, but at different levels. So, what we want to do to incorporate these data together to make one single population index is to use this approach that we've derived from combining the three different NIMS and FWRI surveys. So to do this, we're using classification and regression trees. Uh, it's a strong modeling tool that can account for the fact that we are dealing with continuous and factorial data uh, at different scales. And we want to break down the sites into a pretty simple metric of good, fair, and poor habitat. The idea being that good and poor habitats can be hyperstable through a population, whereas fair habitats can more uh, potentially vary in response to a population change. Um, so what we're doing is using a full statistical model here, where fish presence is modeled as a function of a series of continuous variables regarding the space, the depth, and then the habitat of each video site. So shown in red are all the habitat metrics that we are recording from these videos, say the presence or absence of hard coral. Um, so what this looks like is, so here is an example of a cart model for greater amberjack on the natural habitat. And what this is saying is that if we have sponge, yes or no, and yes, we have a relatively high abundance of greater amberjack on these sites, or I should say uh, high occupancy rate, because this is just presence absence. Then if no sponge, we look and see, is there relief, yes or no? And when this breaks out to, is that if we take the overall occupancy rate of amberjack across all sites, and we draw that with a red line, so in this it's about 0.19 or 19%, so right there, if it's double that, it's a really good site. So if we have sponge, then we'd expect two times more likely to see a greater amberjack than an on average. Half of that value means it's a poor site. So then in this case, it means no sponge and no relief. We have very low occurrence of amberjack. And then fair is between those two ranges, which means a moderate chance of seeing an amberjack at that site. We then do this for amberjack again on artificial reefs. And we can see that the important variables are maximum vertical relief, either greater than 0.6 meters. And even though the occupancy looks rather high, it's still not quite to that two times cutoff. Then geoform, which is the side scan geoform, so the landscape level habitat. And that shows uh, fair sites here, but the good sites are really driven by oil platform materials and large vessels. We have very high occurrence rate of amberjack on those types of sites. We then do this for each species in each combination of habitats. So um, what we see is that for natural habitats, we have a diverse set of factors, um, usually relating to the on video uh, habitat metrics. Whereas artificial habitats, the differences are really just driven by relief, if we see it on the video or not. And with that, it indicates that there isn't a huge amount of variation in artificial reef occupancy for these species across the sites or the metrics we're recording on them. But once we have those models done, we then have this shared habitat variable that we can use in an indexing model. So it's a GLM where we're modeling the max N as a function of the year, the habitat strata, so artificial or natural, and that fair, good, or poor habitat. Then we're using some area-based weighting to adjust those uh, models to account for the fact that these reefs are uh, different footprints in the area. 
So when I'm talking about waiting by area, this is what I mean. We are side scanning a pre-selected station and pulling it one nautical mile in each direction. And in this example, we've drawn some habitat. You can imagine these large orange habitats as low relief reef habitat that are uh, interdispersed. And maybe some of these smaller circles could represent uh, smaller artificial reefs that we're seeing. Now in that region, it's important to note that of all the reef we've seen and mapped, 97.9% .9 of it is natural reef. So while we've seen a large number of artificial reefs in terms of area, they're only 2.1% of the total reef area. And what this yields is then a statistically valid, appropriately spatially weighted uh, combined index for artificial and natural habitats for these fish in that region of the Gulf of Mexico. In blue, you can see the artificial reef signal for triggerfish here. In orange is the natural signal. And then the black, which is barely visible above the orange, is the combined index. And you can see it pretty much identically tracks the natural reef trend. We see that same pattern for red snapper, vermilion snapper, which are incredibly uh, stable through time for both habitats. And if anywhere it might be different, you could say maybe a little bit for amberjack, these, the blue line, the artificial data is pulling that combined index a little bit off of the natural trend. Uh, but if you recall, that's the fish where they were two times more abundant on artificial reefs. So our most extreme example. So why is this and why do they track the natural trends so strongly? Again, if we go back to this abundance summary, we see these large disparities in abundance at these sites. However, when you account for area and total contributions to the population, it really looks like this, where 94 to 97% of the overall contribution to the trends we're seeing are coming from natural habitats, given to that large disparity in total area of the habitat. Uh, we see this in other uh, studies. Uh, Karnowskis et al. showed that red snapper could be 26 times higher on artificial reef than natural reef, but yet only contributes to 14% of the population or so, given uh, those differences in habitat areas. So with this, uh, we feel strong that this is a good proof of concept of how to start incorporating these artificial habitats uh, from our survey data into these important indices for abundance estimates that feed into the CDARs. Um, the statistical model seems to perform as well here as it did for combining the multiple data sets. Um, but as these artificial data are becoming increasingly more uh, collected as part of our survey and increasingly more of management interest, it's really important to get these data into the assessment process. Even though the results showed a overall low effect on the overall population trend, we still want to account for these habitats appropriately. And so with this method, we feel like we can go forward and start incorporating these data as they become available into the uh, standard assessment process. And we want to also explore some alternative weighting metrics, perhaps based on a frequency approach rather than an area um, as, as these efforts continue. With that, I'd like to acknowledge a large effort uh, from the FIM field and office staff, both reading videos and putting them on reefs and side scanning, and our number of our NOAA and NIMS collaborators. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions in our Q&A session. Thanks. Thank you, Kevin. Next up is Tiffany Cross. Tiffany is with the FWC Fish and Wildlife Research Institute, where she's been for the past seven years. And she's connecting to us this morning from Coos Bay, Oregon. Welcome, Tiffany. Take it away. Thanks, Keith. So um, today I'm going to be presenting about how we've been monitoring private recreational catch and effort on artificial reefs using two independent methods. Um, artificial reef programs seek to enhance fish stocks and increase angling opportunities. And it's essential to monitor the recreational fishing component of artificial reef programs to assess whether they influence angler behavior, change catch per unit effort, and or influence size selectivity, and really to measure the success of the program. So the, the Florida Artificial Reef Creation and Restoration Project developed after the Deepwater Horizon oil spill has been working to deploy 3,000 artificial reef modules within 48 different permitted areas in Florida's state waters in the five-county region in the Panhandle. And 
Throughout this presentation, I'll refer to three major regions in Florida, the Panhandle region shown in white, uh, the Big Bend region shown in the light gray area, and the Peninsula region shown in the dark gray area. The objectives of my presentation today are to share with you the work we've been doing here at FWRI's Fisheries Dependent Monitoring subsection to estimate private recreational fishing effort and catch on artificial reefs in Florida's Gulf waters. And I'll show you results from two independent survey methods we use to estimate effort. And so to achieve these objectives, we utilized an existing survey the Gulf Reef Fish Survey that was originally designed and implemented to measure recreational catch and effort and improve precision of those estimates for reef fish in the Gulf of Mexico. The Gulf Reef Fish Survey consists of two components. The first is a mail survey that asks anglers trip specific information, how often and where they fish and the types of fish they targeted that is used to estimate fishing effort and the second is a dockside intercept survey that collects information from anglers about the types and quantities of fish they harvested and released, as well as length and weight data. The Gulf Free Fish Survey is complementary to MRIP's Access Point Angler Intercept Survey. And we combine catch data from both the Gulf Free Fish Survey and the MRIP APIS to estimate total catch. In 2016, we added questions to the effort survey that enable estimation of effort on artificial reefs. And then in 2019, questions were added to the MRIP APIS to enable estimation of catch on artificial reefs. The survey generates monthly catch and effort estimates for 10 reef fish species in the Gulf of Mexico. In addition to the Gulf Reef Fish Survey, we also conducted vessel count surveys at inlets in the Panhandle to assess recre recreational fishing effort at artificial reefs. In 2017, we surveyed Pensacola Pass, Destin Pass, and St. Andrews Pass in the Panhandle region. And in 2019, we surveyed those three passes and also added Mexico Beach Pass as well. And so what we learned from the Gulf Reef Fish Survey is that from May 2016 to December 2019, about 1.3 million angler reef fish trips were taken in the Panhandle region of Florida. The top figure here shows the angler reef fish trips in 2019 in the Panhandle, Big Bend, and the Peninsula regions of Florida. The brown bars, or orange colored bars, show trips where anglers reported spending no time at artificial reefs, while the blue bars represent trips where anglers reported spending some of their time at artificial reefs. And you can see here that in the Panhandle, artificial reefs accounted for the majority of angler trips, while in the other two regions, anglers have to travel much further offshore to access artificial reefs and reef fish in deeper water. In the bottom figure, we have relative proportions of angler trips for all reef fish trips on the left and for artificial reef trips on the right. And what we learned is that the Panhandle region accounts for only about 30% of all reef fish trips taken during the time May 2016 to December 2019. However, as a region, it accounts for nearly half of all artificial reef trips taken in Florida's Gulf waters and about 73% of all panhandle reef fish trips occur on artificial reefs. Moving on now to the vessel inlet count surveys. Here, I'm showing you angler trips by month during the 2017 red snapper season for reef fish trips in general on the left and for artificial reef trips on the right. The gray bars depict the vessel inlet counts estimates, and the green bars depict the Gulf Reef Fish Survey estimates, and the error bars represent 95% confidence intervals. We expected the Gulf Reef Fish Survey estimates to be slightly higher because there are some minor inlets in the region that we didn't cover in 2017. But despite that, the effort estimates are within the range of each other, which indicates the Gulf Reef Fish Survey is performing well. 
Again, these are the same figures, but for our survey work conducted during the 2019 red snapper season. And this year, we added Mexico Beach Pass to the Vessel Inlet Count Survey, and the estimates between the two surveys are agreeable. And this is evidence that the Gulf Reef Fish Survey is performing well and is a useful tool in estimating effort and catch on the artificial reefs. So switching gears now, we're going to look at catch estimates in landings and pounds. For the next several figures, we show total landings and pounds for 2019 on the y-axis and the three Florida regions on the x-axis. And again, the brown bars depict landings where anglers reported spending no time at artificial reefs, while the blue bars represent landings from trips where anglers reported at least some of their time was spent fishing on artificial reefs. The error bars represent the 95% confidence intervals. For gray trigger fish and red snapper, the panhandle accounts for 82% and 73% of harvested weight, respectively. And for both species, a very large proportion of harvest is from trips where anglers reported spending at least some of their time at artificial reefs. These results are not surprising since the majority of the effort in the panhandle is on artificial reefs. Here, the story is similar for vermilion snapper on the top graph in terms of the panhandle accounting for 80% of harvested weight, but the habitat types of the landings are more even. And in the lower graph, you see a contrasting story for red grouper, where the peninsula region accounts for 91% of harvested weight, and the majority of the harvested weight is from trips where the angler reported spending no time on artificial reefs. And here's the figure for gag grouper. The large error bar for landings in the peninsula region at artificial reefs is an artifact of low sample size. And the Big Bend region accounts for about 41% of harvested weight, with the panhandle and peninsula regions accounting for about 30%. And the habitat type for, la for landings is about even. And finally, I threw this last figure in um, but I, because I wanted to show you that we're also capable of estimating discards on artificial reefs. And so the bottom figure shows the total releases or discards in numbers of fish for gray trigger fish. The panhandle region accounts for 82% of all gray trigger fish discards. And a majority of those discards occurred on trips where anglers reported fishing on artificial reefs. I included this figure because many of these reef associated species in the Gulf of Mexico are managed under annual catch limits with short recreational seasons and or early closures due to quotas being met. And so for many species and reef fish anglers, I think the story is one of if you build it, they will come. Artificial reefs may be an insignificant portion of total habitat area, but they aren't insignificant in terms of total catch or discards for many species. Artificial reefs alter angler behavior, whereby effort is concentrated at artificial reefs in the case of the panhandle region, and they also increase efficiency in catch and in the time and fuel spent by anglers to obtain their harvest. And from a fisheries management perspective, there's a potential opposite effect of enhanced angling opportunity and increased fish stocks, for example, gray trigger fish, where the recreational harvest season closed early due to quota being met. And the Gulf Free Fish Survey here is a valuable tool to assess recreational catch and effort on artificial reefs. So our next steps are to evaluate selectivity of sizes of fish caught on artificial reefs versus natural or other habitat types. And we would also like to explore catch rates for various artificial reef depths and reliefs as we collect more data. And finally, the State Reef Fish Survey is the statewide expansion of the Gulf Reef Fish Survey to the Atlantic Ocean, where we are gathering the same information for artificial reefs there. And with that, I'd like to thank you all for attending the summit and for listening to my presentation today. Thank you.
All right, I want to thank all the um, uh, speakers for a great talk. Uh, please turn on your um, uh, cameras so we can start the Q&A session. Uh, my name is Jeff French and I'm with the Artificial Reef Program and I'll um, be moderating this session along with uh, Brittany, if you want to introduce yourself. Sure, thanks Jeff. My name is Brittany Hall Sharp and I'm with the University of Florida IC Extension and I'm a Florida Sea Grant agent and community. All right, so um, we've had some questions in the uh, in the chat. This is all, you know, just it's a huge effort by you all for uh, for this information you all are gathering. It's uh, really eye opening to me. So it's, it's really good talks. Um, I guess first was a question that was kind of addressed in the chat, but I think it's important to bring up. And that was from Dr. Harborn asking about um, the regal damsel that is uh, the invasive regal damsel that's starting to appear in the Gulf. Um, for those that aren't aware, and Kevin, I think you answered this in the chat a little bit about um, you think you guys have seen it a few a few places in the uh, in the Gulf surveys. Uh, yeah, um, I'm only tangentially aware of this. We had some uh, interest from a grad student that was going to look into those data. And so I did a precursory look and we have records of it, but it's only a few. Okay. Uh, yeah, so I far. Know, I know if, I don't know sure if Bob Cox is, is in the chat at all, but if he could add to, I know that uh, Bob and Carol Cox from Embarra, Mexico beach, I know they've seen it and, um, and have posted pictures of that invasive and they've, uh, have that on their, on their site as well, but they reported to us initially. And Sean, did you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I, I quickly asked some of our video readers about, you know, observing any of that species and, and they do have it listed as something that we're looking for. However, they also pointed out that it's it's confusing to um, see on video or identify versus brown chromis. So, but we are aware of it and keeping it on the radar. Yeah, I think it only has one kind of distinctive marking that's kind of difficult to, to see, especially with the stereo camera. Um, so uh, another question we had in the chat, uh, this one's to Tiffany, um, this is from Christine. Uh, do the artificial reef, the artificial reef question that, that you all put on the Gulf Reef Fish Survey, does that carry over to the Atlantic? Are we gonna get the same type of information from the, I guess now statewide survey? Oh, I guess you just answered in the chat too. <laughs> oh, it looks like you're muted, Tiffany. Sorry about that. I've got two different mute buttons to, um to take care of. Um, so yes, the answer is yes. The artificial reef questions do carry over. And um, essentially the survey questionnaire is the same in terms of what questions it asks anglers and in the order they're asked. Um, the differences that we added are the new regions for to cover the East Coast. We added some strata and then the, the new species as well. And then in terms of how often um, that question is answered on the survey, um, the artificial reef question is only if they took a trip. So if they didn't take a trip, there's nothing to report. Um, we took the general, we used to have a general question that asked if at any time they go fishing, do they fish on artificial reefs? And we took that one away. So if they took a trip, most of the time they answer the question. We don't really see many skipped um, parts of the survey, um, but I'd be happy to look into that and we can quantify that. So, yeah, it's definitely, uh, definitely eye-opening with the, uh, the amount of responses came back with how many people at least visit artificial reefs at some point, either for bait or for regular fish. So it's definitely heavily used. Um, so we had a, a kind of a discussion in the chat too. Maybe we could elaborate it on here uh, in, in the video to both Sean and Kevin. Uh, it was for, posted from Bill Lindberg uh, specifically about longer time series FIM data and if you can calibrate for the period before and after extensive artificial reef construction along the panhandle and account for possible changes in regional fish distributions. Um, if you guys want to address that any further in the, uh, in the video um, right now. Uh, sure. I guess the main thing is that the data that we're talking about on artificial reefs that we're using for our indices and our assessments only start in 2014. Um, however, starting with 2014, we have paired mapping data uh, in the region. So we use that in both finding our sites and describing our sites, but also I was using it to appropriately weight our data. So that kind of 2% versus 97% of natural versus artificial reef in my talk. Um, so with natural reef, they're relatively stable through time in terms of relative contributions. We did a simulation study saying if you map 
something about 15% of the entire Gulf of Mexico, the relative uh, proportions of different habitats doesn't change. Um, but with artificial reefs, those numbers will be changing through time. So what I need, what we need to do is continue our mapping, not only to find sites, but to understand the overall contribution that artificial reefs have to the overall habitat in the region. So those weighting values, what we can do is update those annually or semi-annually um, as each assessment comes through, uh, that percentage of overall reef habitat, artificial reef compared to natural reef will be going up. Um, however, also I should mention that area is our highest density area of artificial reefs. So that 2% is the highest it's gonna be currently. Uh, as we expand throughout the state and I start using the statewide data, that number will go down again, but we can update it throughout the process to account for the additional deployments that we're seeing. Um, both permitted and unpermitted. Great, thanks, thanks, Kevin. And um, I guess there's a question that I that I had as well, um, specifically for I guess for Cheyenne, for Kevin is. Uh, so it seems like you guys have the inputs for both um, you know habitat that's out there and what species are at what habitat. What's the next steps for ramping this up to for some maybe some larger scale predictive modeling uh, to try to figure out these distribution of these uh, different species throughout the Gulf? Well, um, I think the main thing is continuing time series uh, as we get more and more data. Like I said, the statewide shelf-wide data that includes artificial reefs only started in 2016. And so we don't really consider data uh, contributable to an assessment until we have five years of a time series. So we're just now coming up to that. and. I guess, you know, and Sean presented how we're really integrating this like large, large scale effort throughout the Gulf. And once we get all of those data on the same, out of the same site selection with the same habitats and the same coding, then we'll even have a stronger ecological data set to work with um, than we do currently. Like right now we can combine all the data, but it takes a lot of effort um, just to combine it rather than even starting to get into large scale patterns. So that, that survey integration is gonna go a long way for what we can say about dynamics of fish on artificial natural reefs Gulf wide. And, and to follow that up, the, the strength of the new design that we showed is that prior to 2020, the way we handled it is if it was natural habitat, period. It was either, regardless of what the type was, it was pigeonholed into natural habitats to decide where the camera was being set. From now forward, we're actually using the habitat data from our randomized mapping and we're allocating effort on different habitat types. So the goal is, is to, to look at those you know, more rare habitat types, higher relief, um, artificial habitats as well, and to capture the species communities from each of those um, strata. And that in turn will strengthen the, the data going into the index. Great answer. Um, we had a question earlier in the chat uh, from Jay, and maybe Tiffany, if you want to elaborate this on um, how would the boat surveys document artificial reef fishing? Um, I guess maybe to elaborate on the information that comes from, you know, you kind of elaborated already on the, the information that comes from the actual uh, Gulf Reef Fish Survey, but what about the actual counts on the inlets? How do you um, uh, go about counting those and how do you determine how many of those proportion of those boats might be going to artificial reefs or, or natural reefs? Yeah, sure. So um, <clears throat> the the vessel counts when we've done them get a total vessel count, how many vessels left the pass. And um, during those counts, we have concurrent dockside interviews going for anglers that are returning, they get interviewed. Um, we ask them if they went fishing, if they did. Uh, they point to a place on the map where they went fishing. We ask them what percent of, of time they spent fishing there, um, which gives us whether they were in state or federal waters. And then we ask them, did you spend any time fishing on artificial reefs today? They say yes. Then we ask them what percentage of time were they spent, did they spend actually fishing lines in the water on artificial reefs? And then that allows us to attribute a proportion of, um, the boats that went out um, and figure that out. And the other question that was really important to ask was to account for um, the boats that left the pass before we started um, 
the, the counts. So like in the dark, when we can see them leave. So we would also ask them what time they left the pass in the morning so that we could um, calculate an error um, and adjust for that for people that left the pass before we were counting. Thanks, thanks Tiffany. And mm -hmm. then it uh, looks like I see Sean answered the question in the chat from Jim about uh, our efforts being coordinated with utilizing resources from the Gulf of Mexico Alliance. Um, so Sean, I just wanted to just repeat that for, for the benefit of people in the in the chat. Well, I, I, I hope I'm answering it. If I'm not, I just need to clarify it. But we have coordinated with the, um, uh, the council monitoring an assessment plan where they're collecting information on water quality sources and habitat sources. And we have um, um, contributed our data, both our inshore monitoring program as well as, as our offshore habitat mapping um, efforts. So I, I hope that that got it. Um, I guess in a follow-up question from Jim is, are we getting involved in also getting a funding from uh, Gulf of Mexico um, Alliance? Uh, not that I know of, I'm, I'm not sure of, uh, of funding opportunities coming from GOMA, but uh, I'd be happy to find out about any. <laughs> um, so I guess I have a question that it kind of relates um, all of your um, data that's been collected. And that is, um, you know, typically we compare both fishery independent and fishery dependent monitoring just to see if, you know, the, the relative trends are matching up. Have you all compared kind of your, your fishery independent data um, with the, the dependent data that's coming in to see if, you know, both are increasing, decreasing at the same rates, or maybe if they're conflicting? I, for, as far as I know, we haven't done that um, internally, but this happens as part of every CDAR process. So the dependent indices and the independent indices are all part of the same kind of working group data process. And often those trends are compared. Um, it's not so critical that they show the exact same pattern because there's real differences in um, determining effective effort and things like that. But this, this happens at the assessment level for a species by species basis. Uh, we just finished up doing this for SCAMP. Um, and so say that combined video index that I prepare gets compared to the head boat, gets compared to the observer data, gets observed, compared to all those different data sources. Um, but as far as I know, internally, we haven't done that. So it'd be an interesting question for sure. Thanks. Yeah. And I know with the CDAR process, uh, it's been more and more important that our fishery independent data is more uh, robust uh, so that it can kind of stand up to the fishery dependent data, which is, you know, is pretty extensive. So I think it's come more and more important that we need to make sure that our independent data has, has plenty of, of samples in order to, to say that, okay, this is a real trend we're seeing and not just any sort of, uh, you know, low sample size or anything like that. Yeah, and if I could speak to that for a second, um, the, the emphasis on independent data is increasing given the problems with changing management through time with dependent data, particularly after 2010 in the IFQ system. Uh, basically that data is really difficult for people to use. Uh, the thing that struck out to me in this whole uh, symposium is the amount of effort that is going into monitoring statewide for all these individual reefs and that county by county basis. Um, you know, as such, it's not, really compilable in any kind of index at this kind of scale. But it seems that people are only using two primary gears with the dives and the GoPro cameras. And, you know, it seems like there's an opportunity with some, some discussions of standardization and stuff that you could generate another potentially valuable independent data set. But I know that's difficult because everybody has their own uh, per reef, per county goals. Great. Yeah, it's um, to be definitely great to try to get, um, you know, some of the local counties involved with uh, maybe using some sort of makeshift GoPro set up to at least try to get some of the inshore artificial reef to add some data to that if there's some sort of standardization. Um, maybe. Uh, yeah, and I think uh, the, the, uh, the one note to remember for that, though, is um, for an assessment purpose, if you're developing data, that length comps are critical. So any gear would have to pair lasers or consider stereo video or something like that. Um, Obviously, our systems are kind of bulky and expensive, but there are other other routes potentially. So and heavy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. 
Oh, I think that's, um, you know, 11 o'clock. I think that's um, where we are winding down here. So um, if you have any other questions for these speakers, feel free to message them directly. Um, and and hopefully you can get back to you. check out some of them have posters as well. Check those out. It's very interesting information here. Uh, but we are going on a 10 minute break now, I believe. And then we'll be back at, uh, I believe, 1110 for the next speaker, which is, I believe, Roy Crabtree. So that would be a really interesting talk. He's got a lot of experience. So again, thank you all the speakers. Thanks, everyone, uh, for joining this session and we'll see you back uh, in the feed loop. Uh, look for the next link uh, coming live at 1110.